everyone. Hello, I'm JJ Joaquin and welcome to Philosophy and What Matters, where we discuss things that matter from a philosophical point of view. Our topic for this episode is the nature of free will. We believe that we act freely most of the time. When we decide the person to love, a career to pursue, or how to live our lives, we have a sense that we are doing all these things freely and voluntarily. Since the beginning of philosophy, however, our notion of free will has been called into question. On the one hand, if everything is a matter of fate, as in F-A-T-E, then how can we be free? Likewise, how can we be free if everything is determined by the history of the universe and the laws of nature? Our notion of free will implies other concepts that matter to us. For example, concepts of moral responsibility and legal accountability. What happens to those things if we don't have free will? Now, joining us to discuss the nature of free will is my dearest friend, Brian Garriott professor at the School of Philosophy at the Australian National University, and the author of my favorite metaphysics book, What is This Thing Called Metaphysics? Hi, Brian. Welcome to Philosophy and What Matters. Hello, hello. Good to be here. Okay, so before getting into our topic, let's first discuss your philosophical background. How did you get started in philosophy and who or what influenced you? Um, well, I suppose I, I, I did some philosophy at, at high school. Um, I remember, not, not that I understood it, but I remember, you know, trying to read uh, A.J. Ayer's Language, Truth and Logic. And I even plowed through all of uh, Karl Popper's The Open Society and Its Enemies, mm -hmm. uh, which is something I could never do now, but, <laughs> but I did then. Um, so I remember enjoying reading them, but whether I understood those other questions. Um, and I suppose also, like a lot of people of my generation, uh, I think I was influenced by a, a famous BBC series called Men of Ideas mm -hmm. that was uh, chaired by uh, Brian McGee, who's also a philosopher. Uh, this was about 1978. Um, and he interviewed all, all the top philosophers of his day. You know, uh, Ayer, uh, Quinton, uh, who else? Uh, Bernard Williams, Williams, uh, Chomsky, so mm -hmm. yeah, so uh, that, that, that was a, that was a very good um, introduction to philosophy, I think, uh, um, and it seems to me that, that you, you you are effectively doing the same thing in the Philippines. <laughs> oh, you the the Brian McGee of Manila. Okay, <laughs> uh, thanks for the kind <laughs> word. Okay, so you you studied at. Uh, St. Andrews and Oxford. So what is, what is, was it like to be in those institutions? Yeah, no, no, I, I was very lucky. I mean, I mean, I went to St. Andrews uh, as an undergraduate to do philosophy and economics. Mm -hmm. But uh, I soon realized what, what, why they called philosophy, sorry, why they called economics the, the dismal science. So I, <laughs> I kind of dropped economics and did, uh, and did philosophy. Um, and in fact, at St. Andrews, uh, you could do more philosophy than probably anywhere else in the, in the country because they had two departments, mm -hmm. logic and metaphysics and moral philosophy. So, so you could basically spend your whole time doing pretty much nothing but philosophy. Um, and I suppose that the big figure there was, was Crispin Wright. Uh, he was the, the dominant uh, presence when I was there. So, so he was a big influence. And then, then when I went to Oxford to do the, the BFIL, DFIL combination, again, I was fortunate to have um, very good teachers, uh, people like Sir Peter Strawson, just before he retired, mm -hmm. um, Paul, uh, Paul Snowden, Derek Barfoot. I even had a, I had a term with uh, Tony Quinton or Lord Quinton. <laughs> uh, I remember nothing about what he said, but I just remember that he was an incredibly funny guy. It was, it was a very amusing term anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> So yeah, so so St Andrews and Oxford um, were a very very useful influence. Okay, so what was it like to be under Peter Strawson, Derek Barfit, and all those big names? How did they um, influence you, your way of thinking? Well, I mean, it's very good. I mean, they were all very conscientious, and they actually read, you know, read my stuff, and I, I talked to them every every few weeks. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, I, th I think probably Parfit and. Snowden were, were the ones that helped me the most. 
um, because I think at that time that they, they were at the kind of height of their, their powers or their careers, as it were, and um, uh, they were very useful. Okay, so most of your work centers on topics in metaphysics. So why did you specialize in this area of philosophy? Well, I think it's largely a matter of taste. I mean, I mean, you know, when you're an undergraduate or, you know, you go through all the different topics uh, and you find the one that you find most interesting. And I suppose eventually I, I settled on, so I, mean, I did my, my BPhil thesis on, on the Sorites paradox and my DPhil on, on personal identity. So I suppose I'm moving from philosophy of language to metaphysics. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, yeah, I just, find, I just find topics in metaphysics that the most interesting, you know, questions to do with, with free will or uh, universals or whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's, very, it's basically a matter of taste, but, but that's what I found most interesting. Okay, so uh, at least in your work, so by the way, guys, to our audience, uh, Brian Garrett has a book uh, on personal identity. I use that in my dissertation as well. He was my so-called supervisor while I was doing that. Okay, so... <laughs> Only so-called. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, let's go to the idea of free will. Right. Uh, how do philosophers understand the notion of free will? Right. Well, well, I mean, one problem to begin with is that, that different philosophers understand it in different ways. Um, so, so, so we're really going to be talking about sort of fatalists, and then we'll be talking about compatibilists and, and, and libertarians. Mm -hmm. So we'll be, we'll be defining what we mean by that um, as we go along. But, but, so, but so, so one idea of what it is to, to act freely, um, which is really an issue with the fatalist and, and the libertarian, um, is the idea that you act freely just in case you have um, a range of alternative actions open to you. Mm -hmm. So um, if I'm in a situation where I have to ch choose between A and B, and let's say I choose A, then, then my choice was free, uh, just in case I could have done B instead. Um, so you can, you can maybe call this something like the, the open future conception of free, of free will or free action. Okay, so I think in the literature, it's also known as the principle of alternative possibilities. Yeah, yes, it's, it's, it's the idea that, that there are alternatives open to you. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I mean, as we'll see, that the, the, fatal, the fatalist wants this. I mean, another way of putting that is that, uh, okay, so, so th there's the action that you will do, mm -hmm. but we all think that, that there's lots of things that you could have done instead. So, so at any one time, there's lots of things I can do even though there's only one thing I will do. Um, and what, what, the, what the fatalist thinks, for example, is that that's, that's not true, right? If that was true, we'd be free, mm -hmm. but that's not true. In fact, the only thing that we can do is just what we will do. <laughs> um, so th th that's, that's another expression of this, uh, the open future or alternative actions view of free will. So it seems it's a, matter, like... it's a matter of having alternatives that you could have done instead. So it's like you're saying that you're free in doing some action if you could have done otherwise. Yes, if you could have done something else, yeah, basically. I mean, well, we're going to refine that a bit later, but, but that, that's, that's the basic idea. So, so that, that's one conception of free will, mm -hmm. um, uh, which is to say we associate with the fatalist and libertarian that we'll come to later. Um, but the other idea of free will, and this is what you get with, with the compatibilist, um, is really that uh, an action is free just in case it, it flows from your beliefs and desires or it's, it's explained by your beliefs and desires or some people would say caused by your beliefs and desires. Mm. Um, and the, the important thing is that you're in no way interfered or manipulated by other people. Um, so if I'm walking towards the pub, right, there's my action walking towards the pub. And if that was caused by my you know, desire for a beer and my belief that the pub has a beer, then my action is free. And as long as no one was coercing me or manipulating me or interfering, then my action is free. So you might call this the kind of ownership, just for the sake of a label, the, the ownership conception of free will, because the idea is that, that my actions are free just if I own them, right? J just if they are, as it were, the authentic expressions of my beliefs and desires. 
Okay, let's have a handle of this one. So you're uh, under this conception, you're free so long as your action was brought about or caused by your beliefs and desires. Right, right. Yeah, so that, and um, I mean, as we'll see, that, that's meant to be compatible with determinism. But that, that's the idea. Okay. Um, okay, so but, there are... So, so, so this, this is one problem to start with, that there are, there are actually two notions of free will that we have to deal with, not just one. Okay. There may, there may be others too, but at least those two. There are two main obstacles to our notion of free will. So let's start with the challenge of fatalism. So what is fatalism and why is it a problem for our notion of free will? Uh, right. Um, well, I mean, fa fatalism, I mean, um, so in my book, I, I have two different chapters. There's oh. a chapter on fatalism and there's a chapter on free will and determinism. And I, I don't think this, this, is not, this is not just sort of bookkeeping. I think that, that, that these are two quite different ways of attacking free will. Um, now, fatalism is, is by far the oldest, um, and you know, we, we find it in, in Aristotle. Um, so the fatalist basically thinks that we are you know, prisoners of fate. In other words, that, that we can only do what we will do. So if you go back to this picture of, of, of multiple alternatives, uh, the fatalist thinks that we don't have multiple alternatives. That, that's an illusion. Uh, anything we do, we must have done. It was inevitable that we do that thing. There weren't, there weren't really these alternatives um, open to us. So, I mean, it's a bit hard to define exactly what makes an argument fatalist, but I think it's fair to say that, I mean, I mean one thing you can say, although this, this is just a negative condition, is that it doesn't, it doesn't mention notions like determinism or indeterminism, right? That's not, that's not the issue. That's the other attack on free will. Um, so fatalism is sometimes called logical fatalism. And, and the idea is he, here is that um, we're trying to rely on purely logical ideas, such as the law of excluding middle that says that for all propositions P, either P or not P. Mm -hmm. um, now, I don't think, I mean, th 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 that's in the right direction, but I don't think it's exactly right. Um, I mean, for one reason, I think uh, uh, assumptions about the nature of time and the nature of the future come in, and, and that's not logic, that's metaphysics. Um, and of course, there's also a theological fatalism, which again involves, you know, the, the assumption of God's existence, which is not logic. So it, it's kind of hard to define, but um, it's, it's perhaps best seen by just looking at particular examples of, of fatalist argument. Okay, so let's look at two particular examples here. Aristotle's sea battle argument and the argument from antecedent to Let's start with Aristotle's sea battle argument. Can you give us a, a history first before we get into the details? Um, well, I, I know nothing about <laughs> um, uh, I don't know whether this was, I mean, this was discussed prior to Aristotle. I mean, it probably was, but I mean, I really have, have, uh, have no idea. Um, but but this, is, this is the first argument that you normally get whenever you discuss, uh, discuss fatalism. Uh, it's the sea battle argument. Uh, so, so maybe you want to put it up, uh, slide up. Uh, okay, so let's look at the argument here. Yeah, so, so this is, um, so a, the starting premise again, so, so this is an instance of, of excluding middle, either P or not P. So either there will be a sea battle tomorrow or, or there will not. That's the starting premise. So two, uh, if there will be, then it's inevitable that there will be. Uh, if there will not be, then it's inevitable that there will not be. So therefore, uh, from one, two, and three, you get four. Uh, it's either inevitable that there will be or inevitable that there won't be. And of course, since there's nothing special but sea battles or tomorrow, whatever happens at any future time is inevitable. Mm -hmm. So, so that, that's the, now it's more, I mean, what, what, I mean, I use the word inevitable here. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean logically necessary. Uh, it means something like simply out with human control or influence. So it's beyond uh, human control. Sorry? So that's your notion of inevitability here. It's beyond. Yes, yes. I would define it as being something out with uh, human control or influence. Okay. So, so the question, I mean, well, there's, 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 there's a number of questions. I mean, one is what Aristotle himself thought of this argument. Now, it's generally agreed that he didn't agree with the argument. Um, mm. but, uh, but, people, but scholars differ on, on where, where he faulted it. Um, 
And in fact, I mean, there, there are two ways, I think, in which you can fault it. And, and, and different scholars think that Aristotle actually uh, endorsed the, each solution. Um, so, so the question, is it a good argument? And I think the answer is, is no. Um, so as I said, I think there are two ways you can resist it. Um, I mean, I'm assuming it's, it's, a, it's a valid argument. Mm -hmm. So if, if the premises are true, the conclusion is true. But so, so if, we're, if we're going to question it, we have to reject one or more of the premises. So, so the two strategies of reply are either to reject premise one mm -hmm. or to reject premises two and three. Um, so I'll just, I'll just say something about that uh, now then. Um, so the first strategy, um, and again, some people think this was Aristotle's own view, uh, is to reject uh, premise one. So you're rejecting the law of excluding middle. Um, the principle that for all propositions or statements, P, P or not P. Um, now, you might think this is very radical uh, as a response <laughs> to give up what, what, what we're taught in first year logic as a, as a basic a law. Principle. Yeah, a law of reasoning, right? <laughs> yeah, yes, indeed. Um, but I suppose that the reason why you might, you, you know, the way you might try and justify it is by pointing out the, the kind of peculiarity of the of the propositions that you're concerned with, mm -hmm. namely there will be a sea battle tomorrow, uh, and there will not be a sea battle tomorrow. Um, so, so these these are often called future contingents, um, and, and and what you mean by that is that um, that their truth is not determined by anything in the present or the laws of nature. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the idea here would be, let's say, that there's, there's a naval commander who tonight will decide whether or not there's going to be a sea battle. So now it has not been decided whether there'll be a sea battle or not. So it's a future contingent. Right. I mean, so, so, for example, so there's a reason that Aristotle chose that example as opposed to, say, either the sun will rise tomorrow or the sun will not rise tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Because arguably the sun will rise tomorrow is not a future contingent, right? That's a consequence of the laws of nature. Um, so, so, so he's choosing a proposition that, that would count as a, as a future contingent. So this is simply his example of a future contingent. Um, okay, well, I mean, some people think, um, so that the question is, is what, what truth value should we give uh, future contingents? So, so let's say there, there will be a sea battle tomorrow. Should we now regard that as true or false? Well, some people think the answer is no. They think precisely because it's not fixed or determined, it doesn't have a truth value. So, so it's, not, it's neither true nor false? I suppose so, yes. I mean, people talk about it being indeterminate. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure whether they think of that as a, as a third value or rather the absence of either of the truth values. Uh, again, the different ways you can go in that. But anyway, it, it's, it's definitely not true and it's definitely not false, right? Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have a truth value. Um, I mean, they, they think it'll, it'll become true or it's, its present tense counterpart will become true or false tomorrow. But now it doesn't have a truth value because there's nothing now that makes it true or false. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so how is this different from the sun will rise tomorrow? Does it have a well, definite value? Well, well, we're, well, we're assuming that, that, uh, that there is something now that makes it true that the sun will rise tomorrow, namely the laws the law. of nature. Yeah, okay. And, and maybe, maybe some condition of the universe at some earlier time. Um, but we're assuming that because this is a human, this is the result of a human decision that's yet to be made, mm -hmm. um, it, uh, it, it shouldn't get a truth value. And there's also another consideration that's relevant here, which is, is the nature of the future. Because you might think, um, I mean, some people think that the future is unreal. Mm -hmm. um, it's so yet to come. <laughs> well, it, it, it doesn't exist. For, right. Full stop. So, I mean, C.D. Broad um, had this growing, uh, growing universe view where, where the idea was that the past and present are real, but the future is unreal. Um, so if you thought the future was unreal, uh, then that might be another reason to say that, that there will be a sea battle tomorrow uh, is neither true nor false, because the reality that would make it true, mm. namely the future, doesn't exist. Um, so, there's also, so there could also be this metaphysical aspect to it too. Could be another reason for saying that it's, it's neither true nor false. 
But of course, a lot of philosophers these days would think would say that past, present, future are equally real, in which case you, you, you couldn't make that response. Um, okay, so given... Anyway, so so, so the, the point is, uh, so the reason why this is relevant is that um, if, if, if you would say the same thing about there will not be a sea battle tomorrow. So both there will be a sea battle tomorrow and there will not be a sea battle tomorrow would, would be not true. But oh. if a disjunction has two disjuncts which are not true, then, it then be false. The, whole disjunct, the whole disjunction cannot be true. No, so right. one is not true. So, so you've shown what's wrong with the argument. It's got its opening premise is false or at least not true. Um, so, so this this would be the this would be the first solution to, to to avoiding conclusion five, which of course we all want to avoid. Yeah, because that's a fatalist uh, conclusion that we don't have free will. Right. Right. Okay. So if if we say that this sentence, this there will be a sea battle tomorrow, is indeterminate, isn't it the case that the whole disjunction is indeterminate as well? Yeah. Well, well, it doesn't. I mean, maybe, but the, the important point is that it's not true, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. Because I mean, we only we only accept cogent arguments ha have to have true premises. Mm -hmm. So as long as it's not true, with, whether you call it indeterminate or false, doesn't really matter. It's not true, and, okay. and then so you you have actually. So you might well say it's it's it, yes you might say it's, it's indeterminate if, if both disjuncts are indeterminate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what's another response to this argument? <laughs> right. Well, the other response, um, which which may have occurred to, to, to most people, um, is, is to wonder why why exactly we should accept two and three. Right. I mean, two and three are very strong claims, um, and. We haven't really been given any argument to believe them. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I mean, so it's quite natural to think, well, I mean, if we suppose that it is true, for example, that there will be a sea battle tomorrow, how does it follow that it's inevitable, <laughs> right? That, that seems to require an argument. I mean, why should truth imply inevitability? I mean, intuitively, it doesn't. I mean, it may be true that I will have eggs for breakfast tomorrow, but it doesn't seem to me that that's inevitable. I mean, even if I will have eggs for breakfast tomorrow, I could have had cornflakes instead. Um, <laughs> so, so there seems to be a glaring gap, or at the very least two and three need some sort of de defense mm -hmm. as to how you're supposed to move from truth to inevitability. And on, on the face of it, you could just deny two and three mm -hmm. um, and just say that, that that proposition can be true without us being inevitable. Um, because that, the idea of collapsing truth into inevitability uh, looks a bit too much like the, the fatalist conclusion anyway. Mm. So, so we shouldn't really concede that uh, at the outset. Right. It, the, and the argument now begs the question, if that's the case. Yeah, or at least it, it, indeed we need some support, some reason to believe two and three, because on the face of it, they look eminently deniable. Okay, so for you, what's the verdict against this particular fatalist argument? Is it any good? <laughs> no. <laughs> Brian no, is, uh, no I mean, I, I mean, I, 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 I'm happy to go with either response. I don't, I don't have any particular mm -hmm. uh, views on this, but I mean, uh, either either of those replies seems to me perfectly reasonable. Okay, so, so I don't, I don't think we have to accept five. Okay, so let's turn to another fatalist argument: the argument from antecedent. Okay, well, well I mean, so th this argument actually appears. Um, I know you've discussed time and time travel uh, in the famous paper by David Lewis, which is one of his most readable papers on mm -hmm. time travel. Mm -hmm. um, so he discusses and, and rejects this, this argument. Um, so, so this is an argument, again, you can see why it's kind of called logical in character, because it's, it's exploiting what, what is called the sort of timelessness of truth. That, that's to say, um, if some proposition is true, uh, it seems that you're entitled to, to prefix it with, in 1800, it was true that. I mean, if, if so let's say, you know, uh, uh, Morrison is prime minister in 2020. Well, then it was true in 1800 that <laughs> Morrison would be prime minister in 2020. So it just seems that kind of grammatically, you can always make that, that move and you will end up with something true. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and this fatalist argument tries to exploit that, that so-called timelessness of truth. Okay. So let's consider this version of the argument. Right. So uh, by, by a happy coincidence, I, I am currently uh, <laughs> coffee. Um, Me too. <laughs> okay. So, um, so we make this move. I mean, someone might object to it, but, but I, I'm not going to object to it here. So I'm assuming that we can move to in 1800, or any, any past time, no, it doesn't matter, it doesn't, 1800s either. In 1800, it was true that I am currently, i.e. in 2020, drinking coffee. Um, so I'm, I'm, willing to, I'm willing to grant that, okay, for the sake of argument. And then, so then we have three, but I, I have no choice about what was true in 1800, which on the face of it sounds right. Yeah, I mean, yeah that's true. There's nothing I can do now to affect how things were in 1800. Mm -hmm. um, so therefore, I have no choice about whether I'm currently drink, drinking coffee. In other words, my drinking coffee is not a free action. Um, so, so I mean, this is, so this is superficially, uh, you know, a, a kind of plausible argument. Um, again, it seems to me it's 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 valid. It's a valid argument in the sense that if if one, two, and three are, are true, then then four is true. Um, so. Uh, again, the question, and I'm, I'm not going to question premises one or two, so, so that gives you a bit of a clue as to what, <laughs> what premise I'm going to reject, which is, of course, premise three, right? And I would say that, that and this, this, I think, is, is, is Lewis's line, too, oh. um, that we should reject um, premise three. So, so premise three, as I say, is, is superficially plausible. I mean, because obviously there's lots of things in 1800, over which I have no control or which I have no choice about, but like the population of London in 1800, uh, I have no control over that or no choice about that, what that, what that was. Um, but if you look at what, the, if you look at proposition two, premise two, um, this is a very odd truth about 1800. <laughs> um, uh, now, in fact, I mean, what, what Lewis wants to say is it's not, it's not really a truth about 1800 at all. Mm -hmm. It's actually a truth about the present, disguised to look like a truth about uh, 1800. So it, it's, it's much more natural, I think, to kind of, to kind of reverse the, the, the reasoning and to say that, um, well, actually, that there are some things that I can control about 1800. I mean, because I can control, I have a choice about whether I'm drinking coffee now. So I have a choice about whether or not in 1800 it was true that I'm drinking coffee now. Okay. Um, so, uh, so, so the real, so the problem with the faithless reasoning, and you get this in other faithless arguments, is that, that they're trying to subvert uh, the, the intuitive direction of dependence, right? So it's not that. So, so the wrong way to think of it is that that the truth, because two is true, that is somehow forcing me. To drink coffee now. <laughs> that's completely the wrong way around. Uh -huh. uh, rather, it, the reason to, two is only true because you I are free drinking free coffee. Free coffee now. Right. So, um, uh, so once you see that, then then you see that in fact, in this case, uh, three is premise three is just false, uh, or at least at least there, there seems no reason to accept it whatsoever. We can say that because of the peculiar kind of propositions we're concerned with. We do have a choice over whether they're true, because I have a choice about what I'm currently drinking. Okay, so what's your verdict with regard to this argument? Is it any good? Any version of this one? No. Well, I mean, my, my general uh, view is, is that, 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 I mean, I, I look at other faithless arguments in my book, but that generally speaking, faithless arguments are always bad. They're <laughs> always some false premise, or there's a kind of fallacious move, or some dodgy inference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so generally, I think that the arguments that we're calling fatalist, I think, are, are no, don't, don't really work. They're not, they're not convincing. But many people have that kind of attitude, a fatalistic attitude about life, right? That life is fated to be this way. Well, they might, but, it, but if you ask them, it's not clear what, what they're, what they're <laughs> whether it's based on argument or just a kind of, you know, depression. I mean, it's... Uh, <laughs> but to the extent that we're trying to articulate arguments here, they don't seem to be very good. 
Okay, so let's now turn to an, another challenge to the notion of free will, the challenge of determinism. So what's determinism all about and why is it a problem to our notion of free will? Right, well, so, so as I said, fatalism uh, was around with, with Aristotle. So that's an ancient uh, hmm. idea. Uh, but the problem of determinism and free will um, only really emerged with, with the emergence of the thesis of determinism. And that only really really came about uh, or came to the fore with, with Newton and the rise of science and the Enlightenment in the 17th and 18th centuries. So I don't, I don't think people really thought in terms of determinism before this period. Um, so sometimes people um, define determinism as the view that every event has a cause. Well, I don't think that quite, quite captures it because uh, you need to add that, that, that the cause, um, you know, determines uh, or necessitates its effect. Mm -hmm. um, so I wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't use that definition. I think a better idea is this, it's simply that um, determinism is the view that, um, that given the laws of nature and the state of the universe at any arbitrary time t, um, it's impossible for the history of the universe uh, before and after t to be, to be different or to be other than it actually is. Mm -hmm. So in a way, this, this is a radical metaphysical denial of, of alternatives. <laughs> um, so if the universe is deterministic, then the future is determined. Right? That's to say that the actual future uh, is the only possible future. Mm -hmm. um, so, so this is what, I mean, a lot of people believed, um, at least until last century. Um, you know, if, if you observe that the motion of the planets and this kind of and the regularities that we observe around us, I suppose this gives us some sort of evidence to believe that the universe is deterministic. Um, but of course, if, if that's what you think, then, then, then there is a kind of immediate puzzle, uh, namely, namely how, can, how can free agents, because we are part of the universe too, everything about us. So how can free agents exist in a, in a deterministic universe? Right. I mean, if, if all actions are determined, because our actions are just movements of matter or bodily movements, if they are determined, how can they be free? So that, that's, the, that's the sort of initial puzzle. Okay, uh, let's try to be clear about the thesis first. So determinism is a physicalist thesis or an empirical thesis? Well, um, Right. Well, that, that's a good point. Yes. I mean, determinism is, is an empirical thesis, right? It's an empirical claim about how the universe is. Mm -hmm. um, so, so even if determinism is true, it's, it's not a necessary truth, not logically necessary that, it, that determinism is true. Um, so yes, so it, it, it's a thesis that it would be, up, I suppose, up to science to validate or to, to undermine. So okay. it's, it's not, strictly speaking, a philosophical thesis. Uh, it's, it, it's an empirical scientific thesis. Okay, so it's a scientific thesis that given the laws of nature and the history of the universe that we know now, the future is determined by these things. Right, right, right. Okay, uh, so it's a problem for free will because we're part of the universe. We right. are determined by these laws of nature. So how can we be free if such is the case? That's right, well, I mean, I mean, it's kind of obviously a problem if, if, you, if you go for the, uh, the open future or alternative Mm -hmm. paths view of free will. I mean, you can see how, how there's an immediate tension there. Um, of course, but this is why you have, we have the, so, so but the, there are two different responses to, to this, this puzzle. Um, so th there's the compatibilist and the libertarian, mm -hmm. um, which, are, which are the only views really at which we have free will. So if you believe in free will, you pretty much have to be either a compatibilist or, or a libertarian. Um, so shall I just mention th those, those responses? Yeah, so what is compatibilism all about in libertarianism? Yeah, yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so, um, so the compatibilists are people like Hobbes and Hume and last century, uh, A.J. Ayer, they're all famous uh, compatibilists. So, so you have to remember that, that their, their definition of free will, mm -hmm. right? So their definition was what I'm calling this ownership view, that, that you act freely just in case your actions result from your own beliefs and desires. So, so their idea is that, that my, my, my actions are unfree um, 
if, if they are coerced by someone else or manipulated by some mad scientist or someone puts a gun to my head or whatever, mm -hmm. th then I'm unfree. But they don't think, this is what they think anyway, uh, they don't think that the mere truth of determinism uh, undermines my, my free will, right? As long as uh, my actions result from my beliefs and desires and there's no external interference, then I act freely. And, and that's meant to be quite compatible with, with the fact that we are uh, physical beings in a physical universe completely determined. Um, oh, yeah, so, so, the compatible, so the compatibilist thinks, look, uh, no, there is no problem here of determinism and free will. They're, they're not incompatible. They are actually compatible. Um, now, the libertarian, of course, has the very opposite view, right? The libertarian thinks, yes, free will and determinism are indeed uh, incompatible. Um, and, and it's pretty obvious to see why, because, I mean, the libertarian uh, endorses this open future view of, of free will. So, in fact, the, the, their definition of free will uh, is actually explicitly indeterministic. Mm -hmm. um, so, so here's the idea. So, I mean, according to the libertarian, again, if I'm faced with a, a choice between uh, A and B, um, and I freely do A, uh, then it must be the case that I could have done B instead, right? But with, with the crucial proviso, the past and the laws of nature remaining constant, mm -hmm. right? So they think that when you come to a, a free act, a free choice between A and B, and I do A, it must be the case that I could have, at that instant, I could have done B instead with the past and laws of nature remaining exactly the same mm -hmm. as they are now. Well, that, that, but that can only be true given indeterminism because that, that's, that possibility is what determinism rules out. So if that's what a free action is, then it can only occur in an indeterministic uh, setting. So for a libertarian, since we have free will, free will in the, in the sense of having an open alternative, open future, it means that determinism is false. Right. Well, if you go to the next, uh, the next slide, yeah, we'll see that the, the, there's, a, there's a further move that uh, the libertarian makes. So, so, so what, what I was pointing out was just that the libertarian uh, endorses premise one, mm -hmm. uh, and it follows, you know, pretty obviously from, from his definition of free will. Um, uh, but the libertarian, uh, I think, then goes a bit further because he assumes two, right? You don't have to assume two. You could, you could, I mean, you could reason, <laughs> you could reason determinism is true, so we don't have free will. But, but that, that's not how he reasoned. He says, so, so we have free will. So the libertarian thinks that we, we are free. And so he concludes that the universe is indeterministic. So, so he's actually giving us this philosophical proof <laughs> of the truth of indeterminism. Um, uh, which, which is an interesting uh, addition to make. <laughs> so, um, which of these two views is true? Well, okay, so, 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 so having sort of set out what, what the views kind of roughly are in a very sketchy way, mm -hmm. uh, we have to see whether, whether they're, either of them is acceptable. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I think that the answer is, is no. Um, <laughs> So, so this isn't, isn't going to be a very positive kind of uh, talk. Um, so, so the trouble with, with compatibilism, um, well, the trouble with it is, it's okay if, you, if, if all you're doing is focusing on uh, a particular action and the beliefs and desires that lead to it, and that's all that you're told, then it sounds fair enough, right? So, so take the example... I use in my book. Uh, so Smith, you know, wants to rob the bank. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, so he, he does so and he escapes with the loot. Um, so, so that this would be a, a paradigm case of free action for the, for the compatibilist, right? So, uh, because it, it was simply Smith's belief and desire that led him to rob the bank. There was no one with a gun to his head. He wasn't forced or manipulated. It was, his action was simply the result of his own beliefs and desires. So this ought to be a paradigm example of, of a free action for the, for the compatibilist. But the trouble is, once you sort of, you know, pan out a bit and you think, well, just a minute, but, but his beliefs and desires, um, it, it doesn't really matter whether, the, whether you think of them as physical or non-physical, but his beliefs and desires are themselves events in the world mm -hmm. and they themselves have causes. 
and indeed they were determined by prior causes. And those causes were in turn determined by prior causes uh, and so on and so on, stretching right back to events before Smith was even born. Well, once, once you've panned out like that, um, <laughs> then it seems to me that, that it's, it's very hard to, to think of Smith as a, as a free agent, mm -hmm. right? Um, in fact, th these beliefs and desires now seem to be just like events that occur in him, um, over which he has no more control than he does over the motion of the planets. Um, so, I mean, the problem is that our, our assumption that Smith was free rested on the idea that he really did own his own beliefs and desires. Yep. But once you see that his beliefs and desires are just the consequences of events that happened way before he was born, then that intuition of ownership uh, seems to disappear. And obviously, what holds for Smith in this example would hold for all of us. So, so that seems to me the, the, the intuitive problem with, with the compatibilist uh, uh, definition of free will but it's actually not compatible with mm -hmm. determinism the, the one once you once you take a bigger picture of what's going on uh then then the idea that the agent is free uh doesn't really seem very plausible so so one person who's, who's run with this and made it a bit more precise is uh peter van in wagon um who has this thing called the consequence argument which is uh, a kind of a sharpening of, of the kind of thing i was i was saying here um so I think we have a slide of this. Um, so, so this is a kind of more formal way of putting what, what I was kind of getting at. So um, if determinism is true, then our acts are the consequences of the laws of nature and events in the remote past. So, so that was what I meant by the, you know, determinism. The, the ultimate causes of Smith's belief and desires will be things before he was born. Mm -hmm. But it's not up to us what went on before we were born, and neither is it up to us what the laws of nature are. Therefore, the consequences of these things are not up to us. So this is a slightly more formal way of, of putting the same, the same point or the same worry. Mm -hmm. um, and Van der Wagen does indeed think that this, this is a good argument and it shows that, that compatibilism is, not, is unacceptable. Uh, I mean, there was a famous reply to it by uh, David Lewis in a paper called Can We Break the Laws? That it would be too, too difficult to go into here. <laughs> uh, I mean, Lewis thinks that it's a kind of equivocation and it's actually not, it's not a good argument. Um, but uh, to, my, to my sort of simple mind, it, it does seem to be a pretty, a pretty compelling objection to compatibilism. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how about libertarianism? Well, <laughs> 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 You won't be surprised to hear it doesn't get any better. Um, no, no. Um, well, it seems to me, uh, look, I mean, people have written, you know, books and PhD theses on this. And so what I'm doing is it's very, it's very superficial. But I mean, the, the, there are two obvious objections, I think, to, to the libertarian uh, view. Um, so so one, one, it goes back to, to the point you were making about, about it's an empirical matter whether determinism is true. Um, so, so the libertarian's conclusion uh, that our universe is, is indeterministic is really sort of hostage to fortune. I mean, so, I mean it may be that, that today scientists think that um, indeterminism is true, but it may be that scientists in the future think that determinism is, that determinism is true. Um, so, so if that's how it turns out, then, then the libertarian would have to just give up on the idea of free will. So, so his whole view is kind of hostage to how science turns out in a way that you don't really want a philosophical view to be. Um, I mean, you might also think it's a bit odd, um, just as an aside, when, when, I, when I went through the earlier argument, uh, that you could have a philosophical argument for indeterminism. That itself seems a bit odd. If, if we've agreed that it's an empirical question, you know, one for science to tell us whether determinism is true or not. They're really the philosopher has no business giving us an a priori <laughs> argument that, that, that indeterminism is true. Um, but the second and perhaps, perhaps the, the really, the, the objection that everyone focuses on um, is that indeterminism, and of course it, it's, it's not enough just that there'd be indeterminism somewhere in the universe, but that wouldn't give us free will. I mean, the indeterminism has to be something you know, in our brain or a central nervous system or something to do with us. But the general worry is that, that indeterminism doesn't seem to give us um, a kind of hospitable environment for free will. 
I mean, if you imagine, um, if you imagine that, that you're, you're deliberating on some important moral, you know, question, you have to decide between you know a or b or whatever and you so you weigh all the pros and the cons and eventually you say okay i think a is the best thing to do or the right thing to do and then you do a um so we take that to be a paradigm of a kind of free rational decision free rational action um i mean it would be really odd to think that there was some indeterministic element in that that that, that, that your decision depended on some indeterministic brain event Mm -hmm. I mean, that would just, that'd be really weird. I mean, if, if anything, that would undermine your idea that it was really a decision. Yeah. Right? Because, I mean, random things are things that you have no control over. Right. Um, so, so the real worry, I mean, so, so P.F. Strawson, who, who, you know, um, my old supervisor, um, uh, he actually, in a famous paper, Freedom and Resentment, I think, used the phrase uh, panicky metaphysics to describe the metaphysics of libertarianism. I think this is what he was, he was, he was getting at. This, this is a, you know, you don't want to end up here <laughs> thinking <laughs> that, that your freedom resides in some indeterministic event in your brain. Right? This is not where we want to be. And it doesn't seem to give you free will anyway. In fact, if anything, it seems to undermine your free will. So, um, so we're, we're so things are not looking too good, right? Because even though the fatalist argument doesn't work, it does look as if we have uh, another kind of overarching argument um, uh, that basically both compatibilism and libertarianism don't work. Uh, so it seems that, that, so in other words, it, it seems that free will is incompatible with determinism and free will is incompatible with indeterminism and that would, it would follow that therefore necessarily no one is free necessarily you know free will is impossible um would seem to be the conclusion uh, if, if you agree with with what i've been saying so far yeah but if that's the case then how about moral responsibility and legal accountability how would yeah we well um well okay i mean so, so, i mean one reason why people people focus on this issue is uh, a lot of people it's, it's not so much because of the the metaphysical question of are we free mm. but because it's linked to the question of whether or not we are morally responsible because it's normally assumed that that someone can be morally responsible only if they are free so um so, so so the question here is i mean suppose we we agreed with all this uh and we agreed that free will is impossible mm -hmm. <laughs> then how, how do we how do we sort of get by i mean we have all these practices that depend on the assumption that we are free, that other people are free, that we are responsible, other people are responsible. Uh, how will those? How are those going to to survive? Um, uh, yeah. So it seems to me that that we're. I mean, not for the first time in philosophy. You know, we're caught in a kind of paradox that uh, that sort of reason forces us uh, uh, to deny the possibility of of human freedom. And yet, uh, you know, most of our human practices rest on the assumption that we are free and responsible. So obviously, this is not a comfortable, um, a comfortable position. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's worth mentioning what I mean. So uh, the son of Peter Strawson, uh, Galen Strawson, um, who, who actually was one of the examiners on my DPhil. So his father was the supervisor mm -hmm. and his son was the examiner. So I got, I got that stitched up quite nicely. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, he's got this view. I mean, he's the most extreme advocate of the view that, I mean, I mean his view would dovetail with what I've been saying, but, but he thinks of course that um, the, the whole obsession with determinism and indeterminism is all beside the point. Mm -hmm. Right, because um, I, I won't go into this too much here, but basically he thinks that the problem is with the notion of free will itself, right? He thinks that the notion of free will is just itself incoherent, right? Because he thinks that, that free will requires a kind of self-determination, which is actually logically unsatisfiable in, in the way that self-creation is logically unsatisfiable, right? It, it doesn't make any sense to create yourself because <laughs> to create yourself, you'd have to be there first to do to do any creating. Um, Unless you're a god. Well, <laughs> well, maybe God has always existed, so mm. he didn't have to come into existence. Um, uh, right. So, 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 so he's got this very radical view, and you know. Um, 
And, and you're right, presumably uh, all, all the notions that rest on free will, holding people legally and morally responsible, uh, would lose, their, would lose their, their ground or their basis. Uh, and that's, that's, that's a problem. But of course, but one thing that's, that's worth, I think worth mentioning is that, <laughs> um, and, and, and in a way this is a kind of philosophical problem itself, which is, I mean, if you really did become convinced that we didn't have free will, then, then we ought to give up lots of other attitudes to, to ourselves and to other people. But that seems, that seems practically impossible, right? We, we can't, I mean, it may even be that, that, that to be an agent, you have to believe that you are free. Um, I mean, we, we can't really give up this, this idea of free will or the assumption that other people are, are responsible. Um, I mean, so, so this is one of the lines in, in, in Sir Peter Strawson's famous paper, Freedom and Resentment. I mean, he, he called these things the, the, the reactive attitudes, which are basically the kind of typical human attitudes of praise and blame, resentment, etc., that you have to yourself and to other people. Um, and part of his idea is that, that these are so deeply ingrained in our nature that, that we couldn't possibly give them up. And he thinks that the, the truth of determinism or indeterminism is, is completely irrelevant. Uh, they, they can never force us to give up these reactive attitudes. Of course, you might think that that's a, that's a bit dogmatic. But that, that's, another, that's another question. But, but it, it, it is interesting that, 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 that even if we came to believe that we don't have free will, um, it does seem that we, we would never actually, I mean, if someone stole your car, you know, you would still be annoyed with them. I mean, it's very hard to give up. <laughs> These attitudes, even if even if you came, you know, to believe sincerely that, that no one has free will, um, but, so perhaps, th but that may be true elsewhere in philosophy. That, that, uh, yeah. So perhaps our reason for accepting that there is free will is more of a practical reason or a pragmatic reason. Yes, but but I still think that the, the trouble with the, with the the, the, the Sir Peter Strawson response is, I mean, okay, it may be true that we can't we cannot, but have these reactive attitudes. Mm -hmm. But the fact that we can't but think a certain way doesn't itself show that it's right to think that way. <laughs> right. the, the question of its justification, mm -hmm. no, there's a big debate about that and whether, whether that's actually a good objection. But, you know, that seems a natural thing to say. I mean, just, I mean there may be lots of attitudes that, that evolution has given to us that we, that we couldn't give up. But, but that doesn't make, mean that they're true. It just means that we can't give them up. So... Um, okay, so what's your view, your personal view on the matter, on the nature of free will? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I suppose, I suppose I agree partly with, with, with Van and Wagen. So, so he's someone, I think, who thinks that, that, that the arguments I've run through against compatibilism and against libertarianism are, are perfectly good objections. So he thinks that, yes, that there are these good arguments to show that we don't have free will. But on the other hand, he seems loath to give up the belief that we have free will. So he thinks that somehow or other we do have free will, but he doesn't quite know how. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I'm not sure if, if I'm, that, if I'm that optimistic, but certainly I do think that these, these objections to, to compatibilism and libertarianism are, are really quite strong objections. So, so as a theoretical notion, free will d does seem to be... Um, does seem to be under under serious threat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so on a more personal note, you have been a philosopher for the longest time. You have seen the career of an academic philosopher. So what's your tip for those <laughs> newbies who want to get into academic philosophy? Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. Um, well, uh, generally speaking, I wouldn't. I wouldn't recommend it. No, I mean, I think. I think nowadays, uh, if you can become an accountant or, uh, or a lawyer or a merchant banker or something, um, and you know, become financially independent at an early age, then that's probably what you should do. Um, I mean, I mean, academia over the you know over the recent years has, has changed quite a lot. Uh, I mean, there's the dominance of, of all this political correctness everywhere. Uh, there isn't really anything in the way of kind of free speech. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, any philosopher who's remotely conservative um, will, will either never be invited onto a campus, or if they do get onto a campus, they'll, they'll be shouted down by, by radical uh, social justice warriors. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, there's a lot going on here that seems to me to be, to be um, 
to be bad. Uh, and it, it, it doesn't look like it's going to get, get better uh, any time in, in the near future. So, um, so there's that. Um, I mean, as for philosophy itself, well, it, it does seem to me, I mean, this is just a personal view, that that philosophy is in a particularly kind of fallow period at the moment. Um, I mean, if you look at the, the, the kind of things that appear in the latest mind or analysis, I mean, they're often very specialized, sometimes very formal. And there's this, this whole rise of, of empirical or experimental philosophy, which I just don't, don't get <laughs> at all. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I've come to the conclusion that the kind of the high point of philosophy was really last, last century. Um, I mean, then philosophy was, I think, a genuinely humane discipline. Um, teachers, right, people like Russell, Ayer, Hampshire, Williams, Quinton, these kind of people. Um, and, you know, if, if I try and think of when the last great book of philosophy was, uh, mm -hmm. I would say it was, it was, it was Saul Kripke's Naming and Necessity, which, which was a great book. But, I mean, that came out in 1980. I mean, that's 40 years ago. And there's really been, there's been nothing like that uh, since then. Um, so, <laughs> so, yes, so, so, so I mean, I, I, I'm sure it will get better, but I think at the moment it's, it's, uh, it's a bit of a nadir as opposed to a zenith. Okay, so you're pessimistic concerning academic career and philosophy. Right? Yes, so, so Stoljar was a reasonable optimist. I, I'm a reasonable or maybe unreasonable pessimist. <laughs> okay, so on that note, thanks again, Professor Garrett, for sharing your time with us. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so join me again for another episode of Philosophy and What Matters, where we talk about things that matter from a philosophical point of view. Cheers. Bye. Good. <laughs>